Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Canadian Story. I'm pleased to have my friend Dan back. Dan, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be invited back. You know, the first in- invitation was a great privilege. And then the second one is an honor because it means I did something right. Yeah, you certainly did. And and I think what we're going to be talking about today is uh, something that you and I have chatted about a fair bit, but something that you're probably one of the experts on in Canada, but but something you that is really close to your heart that we talked about a little bit last time. But I think in light of everything that's happening with uh, all of the residential school discoveries and the, I think just the pain that our country is going through on that particular topic, I think it's important that we have like a really thoughtful discussion on what does reconciliation look like? Because there's a lot of talk of we need to reconcile. And I think as you and I agree, there's um, there's a consensus, generally speaking, across Canada that, that something needs to be done about this. But I, we haven't had a lot of voices talk about what that looks like. I know this is something you've thought about for a large part of your professional career. So why don't you share with us your perspective on what that looks like? You're sure. I think Canadians broadly recognize that truth has to come before reconciliation. And we've been in this long very difficult, very uncomfortable truth process. Uh, The truth of Canada's creation at an unacceptable expense to Indigenous peoples, I think, is one that's fairly well recognized. The part that becomes a little trickier is how do we move from truth to reconciliation itself? What does reconciliation look like? Is reconciliation forgiveness or is it something different? If it includes aspects of forgiveness, is that a transactional type of forgiveness or is it something else? These are the types of questions where we really don't have a consensus in Canadian society. We don't need to have it yet. That's okay that we don't. We're still in the truth telling process, but it makes it a very difficult thing to grapple with because nobody's really sure where the train is headed to. Yeah. Well, and I think that's largely a frustration that I hear not from people who do want to see some kind of reconciliation or or something to happen, but they just feel like, well, what does that look like? Is there any way we could ever reach that? So what do you what do you say to people who say, well, there's never it's never going to be fixed. It's just completely broken forever. You can't change history. That's a simple fact. You can acknowledge history though, and you can figure out where you're going to go from there. I think in Canada, part of the piece that makes the reconciliation conversation so difficult is we're living in a number of simultaneous truths. On one hand, it is very true that Canada was built at the expense of Indigenous peoples. There's really no question about that. And on the other hand, it's also true that Canada was settled predominantly by people who were fleeing hardship elsewhere, and that Canada became a wonderful, welcoming home to them. It's absolutely true on one hand that we've had a two-tier democracy that's produced brutal and horrific policies of forced assimilation, uh, policies that ought to be called out and that we ought to have shame over. And at the same time, it's also true that Canada is a stable democracy that's a beacon of peace and hope for the world. And I think that people have a really difficult time grappling with the fact that both of these things can be true at the exact same time. And both of these things are looking in the rear view mirror. Right. So what's, right. So what's ahead of us, right? That's, yeah. that's really the question. If, if this is where we're coming from, both the good and the bad, and there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad, where is it that we want to go from here? Yeah. And, and I think there, that we've reached that point with kind of what's happening in the news and, and just what I see on social media, what I'm hearing from just people that I talk to, We've reached the point where people want to know what that looks like, but I'm not hearing a lot of articulation of, okay, so what is the path forward? I mean, there's discussions of, okay, we need to renegotiate the treaties or, you know, the, the, the most common refrain of, and maybe we should go into this first, the most common refrain that you hear from people who don't know a lot about the issues, we just got to get rid of the Indian Act. Right. We just, and so why, why don't we, we start there? 
why is that where everyone just goes to? And is that part of like this desire for assimilation or is it something else? So the Indian Act, let's, let, let's first talk a little bit about what the Indian Act is. Right? The Indian Act is a piece of legislation. It defines who is a status Indian. Uh, under the Constitution, the federal government has uh, jurisdiction over lands and monies related to those people. Uh, the Indian Act set out who exactly falls within that definition. Uh, we don't use the term Indian outside of uh, legal contexts. Uh, so it's important to recognize that the Indian Act applies only to First Nations. And First Nations are one of three constitutional, uh, constitutionally designated Indigenous peoples in Canada. So what exactly is the Indian Act? It is an act that segregates people. Right? Yeah. It's an act that sets out a, a racial basis for separating people in Canada. It sets aside reserve lands. Uh, it set up some horrific policies like the uh, uh, like the travel pass system. Um, it set up the basis for other awful things um, like residential schools, like discriminatory policies elsewhere. Why do people want to get rid of the Indian Act? Well, because it is a racist piece of legislation. Yes. Yeah. And yet there is a lot of people who like, well, if we get rid of this, then we lose a sense of identity. Is that, or maybe you could explain that. Cause that seems to be the argument that a lot of people make for keeping it. It's like, well, this is what we have. Yeah. And, and here's, here's the tough thing, right? When you're looking in the rear view mirror and you look to where you got today, the Canadian society today is a reflection of decisions that we've made in the past. And there are very difficult questions around who is or is not Indigenous, who is or is not a First Nation citizen. And the Indian Act does set out a definition for that. Um, so there are complicated identity questions that come with this. If you get rid of the Indian Act, uh, there's no more legislative basis for who is or is not a First Nations person. So how is it uh, that we make that determination? The answer that many First Nations will talk about is taking claim of their own citizenship laws, right? right but there's a process right. there that's, 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 that's doing two things at the same time. We're looking backwards and we're looking forwards. And there's this big gray zone blind spot in the middle of it that we're not really sure how to get there. The other piece that comes up on the Indian Act quite a bit is that the Indian Act sets out uh, a, a number of relationship pieces between First Nations and the Crown that we would have to rethink or redesign. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with rethinking or redesigning it. I would say that's probably quite a good thing, but some of it could be quite uncomfortable in conversation. So for instance, um, the Indian Act sets out the basis for taxation exemption for First Nations. Uh, there's no other mechanism for that right now. Um, that is a conversation that has to be had as we work through the Indian Act. So. Why is it that people want to get rid of it? The Indian Act is bad. It's antiquated. It's racist. There's really not very many questions about that. What's standing in the way? Well, we've set up our entire system on the basis of this act. We kind of have a sense of where we want to be. We don't know how to get there. And the work of getting there is quite painful. So without a design, you know, the outcome is people will tend to default. And one of the things that I've noticed in kind of my own study of this and thinking about it is that uh, a lot of people think of First Nations as kind of this, you know, gr singular group, but it's it's a collection of very diverse peoples with very different perspectives. So to have one piece of legislation that oversees all of their perspectives and even the the various treaties that they have across Canada really does a disservice to the situation that we're in because they don't see themselves as one unit. Would you agree with that? You're 100% correct. First Nations are incredibly diverse. The Indian Act creates a, the reservation system, the reserve system. Um, we have an idea of communities on the basis of that system, but that system doesn't represent the Indigenous nations um, that were here before the Indian Act. Right, it it represents something different. Uh, it's not how First Nations see themselves, and you're right. Incredibly diverse, incredibly different viewpoints, different ways of seeing and understanding the world. 
Uh, it's a little silly to have one piece of legislation that's supposed to set up governance systems, set up land systems, set up you know other types of systems that unite across all of them because they they're simply it, it just it makes no sense. Yeah, one of the examples I often use is it's like they speak different languages, they had have different ancestral territory, and they even in some instances have just different, well, they do, they have different stories for how the world is the way that it is, right? And that'd be like saying, oh, all of the Europeans are the same, and we should have the same laws that govern them because, you know, it's just, there's no difference. And it's like, well, there's a long history of difference. It's just that we have been treating it as if there isn't and when we were talking to uh one of the chiefs who was on the podcast uh, earlier this year he he talked a lot about how um the the the, po the papal bull that was put forward saying that they were unpeopled lands and i feel like that's kind of the perspective that we've been coming to on this issue right coming to it where it's like oh they're, they're just <clears throat> they're there's there's not a uniqueness to them there there's a similarity to them because often when you when you're trying to simplify something, you you make it lose all meaning. And it seems to me that our simplif that, that our ancestors in the past approach to this has been like, you know, if if you're a hammer, everything's a nail, and you're not they're they're not acting as if there's nuance here. There's it's it's just oh these are peoples who 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 need to come up to our civilizational level. And one of the things that I've been realizing myself over the past couple of months, maybe even years, is maybe they understand something that we don't. So can you maybe share, because I think part of reconciliation is understanding that we thought we, or like or that our ancestors, not us, but that, we, that, are, that, the, that the settlers and that the, a lot of the institutions that were put into place believed they were inherently better. Right, right which, <clears throat> which is incredible to even you know unpack how we got to that place um you know take foundation stories in canada or the united states doesn't matter which one all of both of them have foundation stories about how original settlers would have died uh had yeah, it not exactly. been for the intervention of indigenous nations who saved them right so people who showed up here originally from uh europe um they weren't even equipped to survive on the land yeah yeah it, it's a little silly to come to some viewpoint that one group of people must civilize and educate the other group of people and incredibly ironic that that latter group actually saved the first group. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, think about it, right. You know, we, we internalize these things, we teach them, we make it part of our, our history. I mean, David, what did, what did you learn about indigenous nations when you were growing up? Well, I mean, I did learn about um, them helping the settlers, and I learned about the various. My mom uh, was fairly interested in uh, Canadian history because she uh, was educated as a teacher at York University and then at Queens for her uh, education degree. So, and geography. So, it was very, very much about the cultures. I remember going to um, up to Fort William and learning about the relationships that the fur, that the fur traders and the first nations had and how those that trading worked um so i, I feel like i had maybe a, a more more holistic than some people had i didn't learn about residential schools i i didn't learn about some of the the, the horrible things that had happened and i didn't understand the pain i i would say right and so like like you said, reconciliation begins with truth. You got you got to you got to say what the truth is in order to even reach that point. And so, I guess that was uh, I wouldn't say a failing on my mom's part because uh, I don't think that she knew either, right? It just, I just feel like it wasn't something that we were educated in. Uh, so I learned about fur trading, and I learned about uh, you know the relate, or I learned about them allying with us against the Americans during the War of eighteen twelve and things like that. But there was never a, uh, I was never uh, admitting that we had, we had not just failed them, but we had literally oppressed them, and so, and it took a while to get to that understanding for me. I don't know, Zach, how, what did you learn about when you were growing up? Yeah, I, I actually want to speak to this. Um, I, I feel bad for my ignorance, but I didn't even understand or know about res residential schools until this year. And so I actually have a question around that, like 
my education around the First Nations as a child was based around how they lived, which I was very interested in because I liked the idea of being out in nature and all of that sort of stuff. But I feel like we have left out of education all of the stuff that's uncomfortable to talk about that. And I question, and I, I would I would argue that it is that way for most of the people that I know. So my question then becomes, have has the government of Canada intentionally left that out of educational programs to cover up the fact that they don't, because they don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable to talk about. Do you have anything that you can say to that? Uh, well, for as a first piece, right. Education is a provincial jurisdiction in Canada. And I, I suspect that that contributes to um, some unevenness of knowledge across the country. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I think more importantly, we've taken a very Eurocentric view about teaching Indigenous history, um, you know, in, in Canada, in the United States, where I grew up, for sure. Uh, I didn't learn about residential schools either. Um, you know, they existed in the United States, in the U.S. Uh, media folks are starting to talk about them. Um, but, you know, I didn't learn about that either. Uh, I learned about farming practices. Uh, and then I learned that there were some conflicts uh, as American settlers moved west. And then after that, uh, Indigenous history disappeared from my curriculum. Um, right. and, I, I, and I feel like that's, that's probably true no matter where somebody grew up uh, in North America. Um, we talk about Indigenous history as an early settler thing, and then it disappears from the curriculum as soon as it gets inconvenient to discuss. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I feel like that was my experience. Why do you think um, A, that is, and B, what can we do about it? And I guess C, like the other thing is, this is, I guess, the conflict uh, for, for people who care but don't know what to do, is we can't take their history as our own, right? Because we only have our own history. They... they in our conversations with uh, with Indigenous people on here, it's like they cherish their history, they love their history. We can't co-opt that, right? We can't. We so we we can't. That there be a great, it would be a great hubris to like say, okay, well now this is our history, right? But how can we help them regain what what has been taken from them while still moving forward? in our own lives, right? Because we, we, this could be crippling, and I think it is crippling for a lot of people, the, the knowledge of, of the sins of our fathers, let's call it. Um, but what we really need is a path forward. So let's, let's start with education. What do you think, how do we educate Canadian young people on what happened and how we don't want that to happen again or ever again or in any way while not trying to, like, co-opt their culture right you know there's an interesting question I, I think that sits below that which is how do canadians look in the mirror right and, and how do canadians talk about what they see i i think that since the work of the truth and reconciliation commission um i think canadians have reached a consensus that we have to talk about these things that this has to be taught uh so so i would imagine that going forward, the type of question that you asked will be on the mind of everybody who's designing school curriculum. Um, I don't know what the outcome of that, that question necessarily is, but I feel like there's a way to talk about it by looking in the mirror. And you can look at examples all across the world of where bad things have happened, um, where countries have taken the hard look, where they now teach about it. Um, I absolutely learned about the horrors of slavery growing right. up in the United States. Right. Um, you know, is there still a lot more work to be done? Yes. Uh, but that was not a mystery to me growing up. Uh, I was very well aware and I knew that it was wrong. Uh, and I knew that, um, that there had to be, that there were continued impacts from that system. So I feel like that's a question that education systems will grapple with. I feel like there's another question that you're kind of touching on here Right, which is how do we respectfully and mutually coexist while going through this type of process? Yeah, and uh, you know, there's there's a really um, strong uh, concept um, 
that uh, you know some of the indigenous nations in the Great Lakes region will talk about, or the Haudenosaunee in particular, um, of the two row wampum. Uh, and the two row wampum, if you ever see it, it's um, it's this wa- it's a wampum belt. Uh, it's a it has uh, white um, beading throughout it, and then two parallel straight lines uh, that that go across it, and they don't intersect. And and the idea behind the two row wampum is two canoes traveling down a stream. They're going down the same stream together, but they don't cross. Right. right? And and that and it's a similar concept that then comes forward out to to what is the an appropriate type of relationship between indigenous nations and the settler nation um, of of people in Canada, and it's that concept, right? We'll, we'll travel through the the stream of life together. We're we're on the same land. Um, and there are separate jurisdictions, there are separate cultures, there are separate histories, there are separate ways of knowing, and those might not always cross one another. Do you still think that that idea is opposed by the settler nation as an overall kind of arching idea? I don't think there's a consensus about what our future should look like. And right. I think that that yes. is the the piece to unpack. I think that's what we need to be discussing right now, right? Like, what does the future look like? What is? I mean, that's the whole purpose of this podcast: is what is Canada, and what will what could Canada become? And I think <clears throat> there's a lot of anger, frustration, pain, shame, guilt uh, around a lot of things. This issue, particularly, there's churches being burned down, and and. And then there's people saying, you know, burn it all down. And then there's, you know, and there's all of these voices screaming at one another, right? And 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 this this comes, you know, part of this is an import from the states, I think, where, you know, the they've reached a fevered pitch of culture war. I don't see that as the Canadian problem. I don't I don't think culture war is is what we're facing. What we're facing is, in a sense. Um, catharsis from so long people weren't paying attention so long the first nations were saying that these things had happened and no one was listening and now it's like the entire culture has woken up but now everyone's sitting here being like what do we do with all these emotions right what do we do with with the with the guilt and the shame and then how do we move forward what does Canada look like? And, and is there a future for, for Canada or does it disintegrate, right? Do, does, do the First Nations take their pieces and the settlers take their pieces and the regions fall apart? Like that is a real possibility. And I think the whole purpose of, of this podcast has been to try to not, is to try to present a series of ideas to our listeners of what Canada could be. So mm-hmm. why don't we paint a picture now, Dan, of what we think going forward and and obviously this is just our thoughts everyone this isn't like uh this isn't a prescriptive it's just maybe we could have a real conversation for everyone to listen to about what the future of reconciliation could look like Mm -hmm. yeah i you're you're touching on something really powerful which is that right now everybody is angry but they're not angry together. They're angry separately, right? right. You know, Canadians, yeah. I think, mourned over, I would imagine every Canadian, and if not every, then the vast majority of Canadians mourned um, over the discovery of children um, buried at residential schools. I think that was horrific and uncomfortable for everybody and, and you know, a, a, a very painful moment um, of truth for Canadian society. And everybody was angry, but very few were angry together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why is that important? There's a common base to build from. People are feeling common emotions. Um, People have, I think, a common want to tell the truth and a common want for reconciliation. And the question is, how do you pull those commonalities together so that people are actually working together towards a vision as opposed to having a bunch of siloed conversations uh, where they're not collaborating, they're not working together, uh, they're all pulling in different directions, and the outcome is uh, polarization. Uh, the outcome is a dense conversation that nobody knows how to get involved in because it just seems too difficult and complicated. Um, 
and that to me is is the really interesting thing. How is it that we get to a place where Indigenous peoples and Canadians are telling a similar version of their same shared history? Like that's a really interesting question to me because if if we can do that, right? If we can agree on the past, then we can start to work towards what is our agreed upon future. So it's 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 about constructing, like you said again, going back to what you said earlier. It's about con- it's about making sure that we're in agreement on what the truth is, and admitting what the truth is, even if it's painful. And so maybe what's happening right now is actually a good process, right? Is this pain is actually an admitting that we're wrong? Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's a very important process. Once we can agree on on the bad things that have happened in the past, uh, it's very easy to then talk about the future because you don't need to continue to litigate the past. Yeah. And we haven't reached that point yet, which is why the truth before reconciliation is so important, why the truth piece is so uncomfortable, um, and and why it is that we're still going through that without an, without necessarily having that vision of future reconciliation yet. Because do you think that it's kind of impossible to have a vision for reconciliation until we've until we, and and at what point? Because here's the question: you can you can wallow in things like this, right? I'm just talking on a personal level now. Like I said, individuals can wallow in their guilt, right? And and as a society, we could we could do that. We could we could you know self uh, you know self harm and and just kind of like get into a state of depression like we're evil we're bad everything we've done is bad this is this is awful but if we don't have a, a direction to go if we don't have some kind of idea okay what can we do about this like then that's where it leads to despair right and and that i guess is my fear is that we're going to end up in a situation where we just despair at ever being good you know ever ever having a future because we're so appalled by the past. And like you said, we can't, we have to have a shared story on what the past was, but unless we have a way out, unless we have some kind of idea of, of how can we not make this better? Cause like you said, you can't fix the past, but some brighter future. I just see a lot of people despairing. Yeah. The trick is not to get stuck in the past. Right. Um, and getting stuck in the past uh, in, in ways that are unproductive won't move us to be able to have a future vision. And, and whether that's trying to, you know, dispute the legacy of, of Sir John A. MacDonald, um, it's probably not a super helpful conversation. Um, or to, you know, try and delve into whether or not um, church arsons are justified or not. I mean, also probably not a productive conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the past piece, though, is productive. Like, how do we talk about these things? How do we teach these things? What else has happened that we haven't yet acknowledged that we need to bring into the mainstream and we have to acknowledge? That stuff is important. And the reason why it's important, again, is it, is it creates the ability to have the collaborative conversation around what is the future. The thing about reconciliation is it can't just be a unilateral vision. It's a super multilateral vision. And as we talked about earlier today, there are lots of there's lots of diversity amongst indigenous peoples. Yes, yeah. So so there's a lot of people that have to be at the table to have this type of conversation along with multiple levels of government, along with Canadian civil society. This is a really complex task. It's a really really messy complex conversation to have. At the best of times it would be difficult. I'd say it's impossible if people can't agree on what happened on the past first. Yeah. So that's our where, first step. Where are those disagreements? What are the disagreements? Sure. So I, I think that we see a number of them pop up. And, and, and I'll start, I'll preface this by saying that I don't think that the disagreements are necessarily widespread amongst Canadian society, but I do think that they're polarizing. And I think that because they're polarizing, they get a lot of attention in newspapers or on TV or elsewhere because they're exciting stories, quote unquote, exciting. Um, even though they might not really speak accurately to what's happening on the ground. Um, but examples of some polarizing stories, you know, I, I would say, um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the news cycle around, you know, the legacy of Sir John A. Macdonald, 
Um, I'd say that that was extremely polarizing. Uh, and, you know, I think that that is, you know, it's an important conversation to be had, but the, the conversation that was being reflected back into the general public, I don't think was actually the conversation that was being had. I think it was, um, a polarized an extremely polarized version of it. Um, you know, I think that we, I think that we see these things pop up time and time again. Um, they're difficult to unpack. They're difficult to accept. Um, but at the end of the day, the vast majority of Canadians have a consensus that reconciliation is imperative. So how do we move past these culture war battles and the polarization to really get to the thing that everybody wants to talk about and do something about to begin with? We kind of all want to go the same direction. We're just having trouble getting over some of the speed bumps. Exactly. Exactly. Can you give another example, uh, other than Sir John A, of, of ways in which maybe we're talking about things wrong and that's that's impeding reconciliation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll I'll take a, a bit of an older example because I think this one has finally started to to die down a little bit. Um, but questions around litigation and litigation settlement, I think, have been quite contentious over time. Um, You'll remember at, at one point in time, um, there was a transparency act um, imposed on First Nations to yes, try yeah. and show chiefs salaries and try and show band council monies. Um, not that there's anything wrong with being transparent about that, but it was a little it was a little strange for the federal government to over to, to step out of its jurisdiction and into other jurisdictions to do that. Right. Um, it was strange. Uh but I think that we have seen these conversations come up around, well, why money? Why litigation? Why settlements? What's this going to do? This isn't a good use of taxpayer dollars. You know, we, we see things like that. I remember, our, um, and you probably remember this too, uh, heading into the residential school apology, uh, a certain um, member of parliament stepping up uh, on the floor of the house and <laughs> effectively making comments to, to, to that end. Um, these aren't helpful conversations, right? right? When when bad things happen and they require litigation, litigation goes forward, litigation happens, there's a settlement or there's you know a, a court remedy, and that is what it is. We've set up a legal system that does that. There's nothing wrong with the legal system doing the thing that it's supposed to do. Uh, having a conversation about whether or not it's wise to have settlements or you know whether or not this money will solve histories of the past that's not helpful. Right. So let's go into another one <clears throat> that I know, <clears throat> sorry, that I know you know a lot about, but uh, that I think a lot of our listeners don't. Treaties. Yeah. A lot of people just know that it's out there. It's this amorphous thing. Can you kind of give, you know, a, a high level, okay, so here's where treaties are at. Here's where the roadblocks are. And mm -hmm. here's how you can understand them from a more nuanced perspective than just, you know, there's a lot of talk of, oh, the, you know, the first nation just want to own all the land. And then, and now there's this, you know, this tradition that's accruing where at the beginning of a speech, there'll be an acknowledgement that we're on unceded territory. I know that in the culture war world, that really upsets uh, certain people. Why don't you give us a more thoughtful perspective on that? Sure. So, so let's, let's first quickly touch on land acknowledgements um, because land acknowledgements are simply recognition um, of the, the history of the land and the peoples who were there and are, and continue to be there. Right. So um, in my view, I, I get confused when, when, when this becomes um, a, a culture war issue, because I, you know, it's, it's a simple reminder of history and modern truth and reality. So we're talking about facts. We're not talking about anything else in that case, but if we'll, we'll turn quickly over to the treaty question. So not all treaties are the same, right? And we have uh, three main types of treaties in Canada. There are pre-confederation treaties and they tend to be um, peace and friendship type of treaties. Uh, they, they set out the nature of the relationship, um, 
between the crown and indigenous nations, they they tend not to think about things like whether or not land title or rights are being extinguished or anything like that. They they're they're really about peace, friendship, and collaboration. Right. And for the most part, again, speaking in very broad terms, those treaties kind of go from the Great Lakes region and east. The second type of treaty group that we have in, in Canada, for lack of a better term, are the numbered treaties. All right. So, so these are the treaties that are in the prairies. Uh, these are treaties that really speak to the colonial history of Canada. Um, what's written in the treaties is not necessarily what was discussed at the time of signing with Indigenous nations. Uh, so there are oral histories um, from Indigenous nations that reflect one understanding of the treaty. And then there's the, these written versions of the treaties that reflect um, a very different take on the treaties. Um, these treaties set out uh, certain commitments uh, between the Crown um, and Indigenous nations. So there are, are commitments in some of them uh, around things like healthcare um, and, and other aspects. And these treaties often have language in them um, that speak to the transfer of land title or the uh, extinguishment of rights. Right, right. And, and then there's a third type of treaty, which is the modern treaty. All right. So um, you're, you're probably somewhat familiar with this history, but I'll, I'll give a very short, brief version of it. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, the Supreme Court um, started grappling with this question as to whether or not uh, a title had been extinguished uh, over Canadian lands um, by the Crown uh, with Indigenous peoples. And, and the answer that came back was, well, effectively, if there's nothing that, that has demonstrated that there's an agreement on that, then, then the answer is probably not. Um, and that sparked off uh, a, a whole new wave of treaty negotiations. Um, so starting from the 19, from the late 1970s, mid 1970s up through today. And modern treaties think about things like um, like the, the government's uh, governance and jurisdiction of indigenous nations. Um, often they come hand in hand with self-government agreements. Um, these are the types of uh, treaties that you see in the North. Um, you, you see them in British Columbia as well. Uh, and these are the types of um, treaty arrangements that, you know, we, we hear about quite a bit these days. Um, uh, Métis nations are going through, um, you know, similar types of processes right now. Uh, we, we've, we've had an evolution in what, um, in what modern treaties and self-government agreements might mean over the last few years. So, so I would say, looking forward, there's probably going to be a fourth wave of a different type of treaty in the future. Right. Um, but, yeah. but these are the three, the three that, that kind of exist right now. Why is that important? Well, speaks back to the diversity question that, that you raised earlier. Um, there are three very different types of, of treaty arrangements that reflect very different crown indigenous relations from the views of governments. Um, and uh, at least in one of those treaty groups, um, the view of government and the view of indigenous nations uh, is is not the same. And which one is that? Uh, the number of treaties. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly enough, that that plays a probably a biggest role in like uh, places like in the, on the prairies, right? Because um, those are where the number of treaties are. But it's also where the largest percentage-wise population of First Nations is. Um, like in terms of Manitoba, it's the highest percentage of the population that's First Nations in, uh, for any province, I believe. Is that correct? I I don't know the uh, I, I don't know offhand um, what the per capita um, percentage would be. I, I I do know that Nunavut has the highest oh, um, true, yes, per capita true. overall. You know, Nunavut. Um, you know, a, a territory that came out of a modern treaty arrangement um, where I, I believe it's over 90% of the population is uh, Inuit. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> no, that, that's a good point. I, I sometimes forget about the territories. My apologies to all our territory friends. <laughs> um, I, so 
I liked what you had to say, and I want to dig into it more. A fourth wave of treaties. What does that look like? What do you, I mean, just speculate here with me for a second, because, you know, this is a future focused podcast. Um, and how could you think if, if you were to say, like, here are some ways that this could be done well so that we could achieve more reconciliation? And maybe the question isn't full reconciliation, right? Maybe, maybe we're not looking for maybe reconciliation is a process, not a destination. It absolutely is a process over a destination. Uh, you know, I, I think if I think if we were to look for inspiration, let me take a, a, a quick step back first off. Reconciliation is a process, and we haven't had a lot of great conversations or a lot of great processes that are civil society focused in that, right? So I, I think first and foremost, we have to think about how reconciliation is encompassing civil society and how civil society is able to interface with reconciliation itself. Not a lot of conversation about that, not very clear how something like that would happen, but that is not really in the landscape at this point in time. Mm -hmm. If we were to look at a place though, where we might want to draw some inspiration from, I would offer the Northwest Territories wouldn't be a terrible place to start looking. Okay. Right. So the Northwest Territories um, has a number of, of, of modern treaties and self-government agreements. And there are still some areas that are negotiating um, modern treaties or self-government agreements. There's a consensus territorial government. Um, there's a significant uh, indigenous population. Um, and there's a very strong, robust indigenous economy. Right. Um, there's very strong representation of indigenous peoples and in local governments. There are indigenous self-governments that coexist um, with municipal uh, and town governments and a territorial government. Um, there, are, there are tables that exist between the government of the Northwest Territories and indigenous governments um, to, to effectively work together uh, on areas of their overlapping jurisdiction. Right? There, there are some really interesting things here. When I spoke in the, the beginning about how we have to accept that there are multiple simultaneous truths, yeah. well, the Northwest Territory has done that, right? The, the Northwest Territory has accepted that there are multiple simultaneous jurisdictions and these things are just real. And, they're, and we you, just have to work with them instead of just, fight. Exactly. You just work with them. Um, they've, you know, the economy of the Northwest Territories has really opened itself up to the reality that there are strong indigenous economies and strong indigenous businesses and they are local um and you know there are benefits to working locally with indigenous businesses that you might not accrue if you were to come up with other types of um procurement strategies or supply strategies uh so so i would offer that that's a really interesting case study about what the future could look like that's not to say that that, that everything is perfect there because it's not um and the learnings have come at a very steep learning curve, but it's a very good example of what a future, what one possible future state could look like. Yeah, one that is more integrated and will, and open to conversation, but also, like you said, is admitting that there are multiple real or multiple truths going on here that need to be reconciled in order to move forward. Exactly. Yukon also is an interesting place to look. Nunavut is also an interesting place to look. There's a commonality between these three, which is that all of them have modern treaty arrangements. Right. So maybe part of the road to reconciliation is to admit that we need new treaties, but to, but to say, okay, we need these new treaties, but they need we need to be very thoughtful about how we're approaching them. Well, we don't necessarily need new treaties, right? Because what is, what is a treaty? Right, it's it's basically a, an agreement between parties capturing what they understand the nature of their relationship to be. Right, right. Um, you know, when I when I talk about the number of treaties, the number of treaties don't have to be thrown out, right? Um, but there are two vastly different understandings about what these treaties mean, and those understandings need to be reconciled, right? Indigenous groups in the prairies, you'll often hear 
and let me be more precise. It's First Nations and the Prairies, because First Nations are the ones who signed treaties yeah. in the Prairies. Um, First Nations and the Prairies will often talk about the the need to start honoring the treaties. Right? You'll hear that in Ontario too, quite a bit. And that makes sense, right? They they have an understanding of the agreement that they reached with the crown, and the starting place would be to honor that agreement. That makes sense. You don't necessarily need to replace what's there. You do need to reconcile the difference in understanding. And it is important to think about what that pathway forward looks like. Yes. So those those treaties aren't necessarily being honored today. Am I understanding that correctly? So again, it's 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 nuanced because there are, are very different understandings of what these treaties mean. And from the view of First Nations and the Prairies, they are not being honored. Um, I think as a as a member of civil society who is a nerd and reads a lot of policy, um, it's pretty easy for me to look at those treaties, look at the history of what's happened since Confederation, and say, yeah, it it seems like Canadians did not live up to to what's their in their side of the bargain kind of thing. Yeah. Huh. That that sucks. <laughs> That's it's, interesting. Uh, so it's why it, the truth telling is so important. Yeah. So what are I don't I'm I'm very ignorant to how all of this works. What are the consequences of uh us not holding up our end of that deal? Are there consequences? Well, I mean, here's here's where we start to get into colonialism itself, right? I mean, we are the three of us are sitting here as members of civil society chatting about this. Um, we aren't, you know, crown levels of government. Um, we don't represent the crown in any way, shape or form. And these are agreements between the crown and, and first nations, right? What is the outcome of not following that? Well, you can go to court. Um, you can litigate, um, you can seek settlements uh, or you can try and negotiate outcomes. And I think, you know, we know that from the history of Canada, those three outcomes haven't necessarily, or those, those three avenues haven't always been open to First Nations, right? It's, you know, it's um, relatively modern history that First Nations were even legally allowed to hire lawyers. Right. Which is so brutal. Yeah. Like, how, whose idea was that? That's a <clears throat> terrible well, idea. Well, it was like, it's like uh, Matthew... <laughs> Uh, Chief Matthew said to us is like they weren't even seen as human. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just, unbelievable. Yeah. Yep. So many of these avenues are, are only open now. Right. And you know, there's there are there there's rightfully in my mind a, a call for 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 the relationship to change and for a recognition of past history. But how but again, you, you can't fix the past. So we have to reconcile with the past. We have to recognize the past. We have to do things to, to remedy the past. And we have to look forward to the future. And I'll spare you my rant on the goods and the bads of litigation. You know, there's, you can reach <clears throat> right, remedy yeah. on one hand. Yeah. And on the other hand, it's, it's highly adversarial. Um, but there are a few other mechanisms. Well, I think we have about five six minutes left so i've really enjoyed what we've talked about so far but i want us to kind of boil this down to what are the tangible steps not only that we can take as individuals which i think is educating ourselves and and getting into deeper and meaningful relationships with people that are different than us and people who have different perspectives but what are what are the some tangible steps that canada like we're only advising like you said the crown we're just members members of civil society, what are tangible steps? This is a problem that you've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, what are some of the conclusions that you've come to? So my biggest conclusion is that we need to find a way for civil society to enter the conversation. And we need to find ways for civil society to engage um, in the process of, of truth and of reconciliation. And that's really difficult because, as you pointed out, it's easy for an individual to wallow in despair about the history or to, you know, buckle down about some polarizing issue on one side or the other. 
And those things aren't super helpful. There are things that members of civil society can do, though, that are helpful. Members of civil society can learn. First and foremost, we can make a commitment to educate our children, our nieces, our nephews, the next generation. That's something that we can do. We can make a commitment that uh, we are going to work towards a more inclusive society. And we can bring that commitment with us into a lot of the decisions that we make on a regular basis, whether that's um, hiring decisions, whether that's decisions about accessing platforms like this one. Um, there are opportunities for us to, to really engage more with the story and to make sure that it's being told, to engage with the history and make sure that it's being shared. These are things that members of civil society can do. And I think that that's the number one thing for us to focus on, because that is the thing that actually is uh, something that we can control. Right, mm -hmm. right. Do you still see any active opposition in government toward any of this? Or is this, or is there a fairly clear consensus that this needs to be looked at again? Well, politics is downstream from culture and society, yeah. right? And yeah. I, I think that culture and society across Canada is pretty clear that reconciliation is an imperative. Um, you know, I, I think that the two of you watch politics fairly closely. So I'll, I'll turn that question right back around and ask you, do you, do you see anywhere where, where there's political opposition to the concept of reconciliation? I think there's a lot of cynicism, right? I think, I think fundamentally people don't believe that this problem can be fixed. And so it, it's, it's almost like, um, I had, a. <laughs> I had someone, a more cynical pr friend of mine, say that they believed that Canada was going to limp forward through history like an unhappy couple in a religious community who could never get divorced but hated being married to one another. What a bright outlook. And that was not a, <clears throat> wasn't a very bright outlook, but I think that is the major opposition, right? I think it's, it's a lack of optimism, a lack of belief that things can get better. And that seems to be the milieu that we're swimming in in general, right now as a society is, is that we, we feel like things are just getting worse. So I think, I think that's the number one opposition. And like you said, politics is downstream from culture. So I think a lot of, I mean, one of the big ones is clean drinking water, right? And it doesn't matter which government did it. It's just, how is this still not something that is being dealt with? And I, th I think there's a cynicism uh, in a large, whether right or left, uh, aspects of our country who is saying, well, people are saying the right things, but what are we doing? Yeah, interesting. I think, I think to a, a certain extent, Dan, you already kind of answered that cynicism by saying, control what you can, because there is so much that is beyond our scope of immediate control. And the, the problem can seem daunting if you look at it from that bird's eye view. But there are things that we can do today in our own lives that can push this forward in a helpful and, and, uh, and, and a way that creates change. And I think if we focus on those things, um, considering and understanding that politics is downstream from culture, if we shift the culture and we talk to our friends and we get better our, ourselves, you can always control yourself. If, if we get better ourselves, our government will be forced to get better. And it might be a slow and ugly process and the truth might be painful, but we can choose to put one foot in front of the other today. And I think that's what we should be doing. Yeah, and you both spoke to how much you've already learned over the last year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, that's clear looking in the rear view. And, you know, looking forward ahead, you can, you can come up with the idealized future version of you and your state of knowledge and what you've done to contribute to reconciliation. There's going to be this gray zone patch of fog in between now and then. Yeah. Yeah. But I bet you, if, uh, if this is something that you really wrapped your arms around in a year from now, we could have another conversation like this and you would be sharing so many more things that you learned in the last year. And if we all did that as a society, we could sit down a year from now and say, maybe we're not there yet, but look how far we've come. <laughs> and, and, and I think maybe my takeaway from this conversation, and I hope everyone who's listening is, this is an incredibly complex problem, uh, but it isn't about getting a solution. It's about going towards 
a solution, trying trying to fix what we can along the way. It's the process. Reconciliation is not an outcome. It's a process. Precisely. Thank you for having me again. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks Dan. for coming, well, Dan. <laughs> thanks for coming back. Uh, always a pleasure having you on the show and uh, hearing you speak. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Canadian Story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at The CAD Story. That's The CAD Story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great their country is.